Okay, I'm going to start the meeting. Um, it's our honor today to have Helen Hutchison as our guest speaker on Proposition 15, the Schools and Community First Measure. I'm going to read to you from the, the League website because I think it's a particularly nice introduction for her. She's the most recent past president of the League of Women Voters of California, having joined the board first as the government director and then as the second vice president for advocacy and program in 2008. While serving the State League, she has been active in strategic planning, initiative and referendum reform, human resources, training, legislation, ballot measures, and redistricting. There's not a whole lot she hasn't gotten her hands into. She has been a member of the League of Women Voters since 1969. She and her family have moved around the country, providing many opportunities to join leagues in different cities. Claremont, California, Newton, Massachusetts, Los Angeles, Claremont, again, Clackamas County, Oregon, DeKalb County, Georgia, and she was the president of the League of Women Voters Oakland from 2003 to 2007. She served on the boards of the Claremont, Clackamas County, and Oakland leagues in a variety of roles. Each league has provided new areas to learn about and get active in. Professionally, Helen is a retired computer systems analyst. She is an active member of Montclair Presbyterian Church in Oakland and a foster care volunteer with the East Bay Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And I want you to notice that she has two little kittens that she's fostering right now, and they are going to be jumping on that sofa in back of her every now and then. So you can just keep an eye out for that. We've already been treated to uh, one site. They are two of the cutest kittens you ever saw in your home life. So with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome Helen Hutchison. Thank you, Helen. Thanks, Anne. And I do apologize, I'm gonna apologize a little bit for the kittens. I was gonna have a good background, but the kittens said, oh no, we well, <laughs> cannot put up that green screen. <laughs> We're going to be all over it. So I'm going to share my screen to get started here. And get started. And so, Thank you so much for inviting me to, to be here and, and, and thank you for coming to learn about Prop 15. I'm going to do a kind of a basic presentation about Prop 15, a summary of the measure with a little bit of history. I'll talk a little bit about the campaign and what um, people can be doing right now and then we'll have questions. I will also send Anne a copy of these slides either later today or tomorrow. So um, along with a, a, a variety of handouts that I may talk about as I'm going through and I'm hoping then that she will forward them to all of you. Um, so um, about Prop 15, most of us want similar kinds of things. We want good schools for the children and, and our children. We want healthy families and we want safe neighborhoods. But for more than four decades, big corporations have not been paying their fair share towards these services, and they've been leaving the funding for California schools and community services falling behind. California now has the most overcrowded classrooms in the United States and some of the worst ratios of counselors, librarians, and nurses per student in our public schools. Prop 15 is on the November ballot schools and communities first um, and it ensures that our schools and communities will come first with the resources we need to educate all of our kids and services to support all of our families. We have roads that are crumbling, libraries that are closing, healthcare systems that are challenged to the breaking point. By simply requiring that all commercial property owners pay their fair share, Prop 15 will raise $12 billion every year for schools and local communities in California. Prop 15 changes the commercial property tax rules under Prop 13 and only the commercial property tax rules. Despite what the opposition is saying, this is only about commercial property. The current loss is in California, just a quick review. Um, it freezes property taxes in time. Property taxes are, our properties in California are taxed at 
about 1% of the on paper assessed value. And it was that that is the price at the last time it was sold. Those taxes are frozen until the property is next sold or there's a major upgrade, then it, um, it, it is not reassessed. So property is not reassessed until it's sold or upgraded. And that's true for both residential and commercial properties. What happens is that the big corporations are able to hide changes in ownership. They can, they can instead of um, actually doing an outright sale or transfer, they um, transfer 48, 49% of the property and then another you know, two to 3% and then the balance. So they transfer it in pieces and that means that it doesn't trigger the reassessment. That can go on for decades without being reassessed. And what the result is a larger and larger gap between what the value, that valuable commercial property would be paying at fair market value and what's actually being paid. That results in a direct revenue loss to our local governments and public education systems. Both of these are really highly dependent on local property taxes. So what we've seen over the last 40 years um, the, is this drop in, in revenue and without a change in the system, it's going to get just continue to get worse. Another problematic result is that two identically valuable commercial properties likely don't pay identical property taxes. So there's an anti competitive real estate market by it because it rewards commercial property owners who don't grow and don't upgrade compared to newer owners or those who do upgrade. Um, so you could have two properties that would at the fair market value would be $5 million, but that wouldn't be reflected in, uh, in the assessor roles. So, and one owner would be paying $10 per square foot and the other $35 per square foot, simply because the first owner hasn't changed or made improvements to the buildings or has hidden changes in that ownership. So Prop 15 would create the split role in property tax system for some commercial properties, and it's what many other states do. So in a under a split role, it quite literally divides properties into two roles, and role one would be the commercial and industrial property that's valued at $3 million or above. Role two would be everything else that's residential, agricultural, and commercial and industrial property that's valued at less than $3 million. So Prop 15 requires that those largest commercial and industrial properties be reassessed about every three years, which would no longer require a change in ownership to trigger that reassessment. And that would make sure that those identically valued commercial properties are paying close to identical property taxes. And by untethering the property taxes from ownership, we make sure that those big corporations are paying their, their current market property taxes. It does not change the tax rate that remains at 1%. And it means that even after Prop 15 passes, we'll still have some of the lowest property rate, property tax rates in the country. So what Prop 15 is saying is, let's just take a look every few years to see what those large commercial properties are actually worth, their, sticker, their fair sticker price, and have them pay the same taxes as equally valuable commercial property. So how did we get here? One of the big drivers of California's inequality um, is Prop 13, which passed in 1978. Property values were soaring at that time and then resulted in rising property taxes. So Prop 13 created that current system by doing two things. It froze the property values and it established the one fixed rate for all property taxes in California. That helped homeowners stay in their homes, but the biggest winners were these large commercial property owners. The result of Prop 13 was and still is major disinvestment in our public schools and local services and has affected every level, level of government. Property taxes fund schools, cities, counties, special districts, all of those things. Um, in the over 40 years since Prop 13 passed, we dropped from seventh in per pupil funding to 41st We're behind Oklahoma and Texas. So we can see that res the results of the, and we see the results of the dis 40 years of disinvestment in our public health systems and in the crumbling infrastructure. 
some of the big immediate tax breaks a after Prop 13 passed in 1978. Bank of America got a $7 million windfall. Shell Oil got $16 million. Standard Oil, which is now Chevron, got a $47 million tax break. Um, on average, residential property turns over every 10 years so that there, there is a continual um, increase in that property value. Commercial property turns over far less frequently. Um, so it, it's helpful to, to know how the unequal treatment is, how much it's costing our schools and local governments. Um, and so the, the, some of the examples of the reclaimed revenue by region, um, and I, there's a handout that I'm going to send that lists um, for all of San Diego County, every city, every school district, every charter school, every special district, and how, uh, an approximation of how much they'd get. But I'll just say that the county itself, the county government would get over $155 million every year um, I pulled Carlsbad just because it was uh, one of the big cities you have in your area. Carlsbad would get $6.8 million every year. Carlsbad um, Unified School District, $6.6 .6 million every year. Um, and it's, it, it is good to remember that, that the bulk of the money, 92% of the revenues are going to come from a small percentage of the top commercial top properties. Um, Prop 15 reclaims that $12 billion every year for our K-12 schools, our community colleges, and our local communities. How does that work? The property tax is collected by the county, your county assessor. The revenue is then divided roughly 40-60, and that's a statewide average with 40% going to public education and 60% for local government. What actually happens in San Diego County more specifically would may, may differ from that a bit. The public education money, that portion is sent to a dedicated education fund, like a bank account that nobody, including the legislature, can touch. It's pooled from the counties all around the state and then distributed using the local control funding formula, LCFF, which is essentially a com complex math equation that allocates the public education revenue to school districts based on need. It's the standard for most education funding in California now. Um, local school districts then can decide how to spend the money. And they, they put together three-year plans at each school district and then at each school site. The, the planning process involves their school boards, administrators, teachers, school workers, parents, students, and other community groups. The league could be part of the, that decision making if you wanted to be. Every school district in California will receive money. Um, and the education funding will go into the general fund so it can be used for whatever is needed to best support students in that school district. Um, of, the, of the school money, about just under 90% will go to K-12 schools and 11% will go to community colleges. So um, the Prop 15 money and the K-12 schools can be used for it can, can be used for school nurses, counselors, librarians, reducing class size. Um, it can be used to, to buy technology for students doing distance learning, any of those things based on what the, that district wants, needs to spend it on. Um, community college funding, we know community colleges do a huge amount of, of really wonderful work and they are woefully underfunded. The, our California community college system is the largest higher education system in the world. There are more than 3 million students in California community colleges. 70% of nurses in California attended community college. Prop 15 could be used for increasing classes and program offering. It could be used to, um, to upgrade facilities if they, if, or, or, or um, any, I mean, anything that the community college district thought needed to happen there. The local government funding that you get within the county then is divided between the county government, your cities, and your special districts. And you can have library districts, water districts, fire districts, parks and rec districts. And I'm, I'm, I don't remember what you have in San Diego County, but I know you have special districts. 
and then and the that division is actually was set in by prop 13 that what percentage goes to what but then again once again that money goes into the general fund so the counties can take that money and they can say we need to inf in in our community in our county we really need to invest in public health and so we're going to put more money into the public health system um, we also know, being the League of Women Voters, that our registrars of voters are funded by the county government. So we hope that some of that money will go into the um, registrar's office also. Um, the, um, it, it is unrestricted money. The local governments get to decide how to spend it. And you know, we have libraries, parks, firefighters, first responders, senior services. I said public health services, mental health services, housing, homeless agencies, public transportation, all of those things. Um, all of the revenue, whatever is collected and spent, has to be accounted for and publicly disclosed. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So Prop 15 will generate about $12 billion every year. It's collected by reassessing large commercial properties through the county assessors. And the revenue is divided between public education and local governments. The education funding is, money, funding is redistributed around the straight state using an equity formula. And the local revenue stays put within your county. Decisions about how that spending is done is made at the local level. there. Um, so going back to the Prop 13, Prop 15 protects Prop, thir the Prop 13 standards for homeowners and renters. Remember that split rule? It said all residential property would be protected and that is defined as how it's used. It needs to be, if it is used for residential purposes, then it is, it will not be reassessed until it is sold. If somebody lives there, it's exempt. That includes um, small and large rental properties. It includes mobile home parks. It includes nursing homes. If somebody lives there, it's exempt. The zoning is unimportant. Um, it doesn't matter who owns it, whether it's a single person or a corporation, it's exempt. If it's residential property, it's exempt. Um, it, then it also continues the Prop 13 protections for agricultural land. The opposition is spreading lies about this. Throughout the measure, both in the intent and in, this, in the language of the measure, agricultural and commercial agricultural property is exempt, meaning it continues to be assessed the way it is now under Prop 13. The language is broad and it's explicit to ensure that agricultural land will not be impacted and agricultural property will not be impacted. It also exempts all the land designated for open space or conservation uses. So remember that split role, whatever, which by definition keeps agricultural property in a totally separate category um, and deals only with commercial and industrial land and property. So Prop 13 provides some tax breaks for small businesses. Um, it does that because it, it adds a tax relief and, um, and, and it provides businesses new tax relief and invests in the communities around them. It also exempts the vast majority of commercial properties so that we can invest in small businesses. There's a tax cut in the fixtures and equipment tax, which is sometimes called the personal property tax. It's a, um, under current law, businesses pay a property tax on things like equipment, supplies, machinery, desks, chairs, restaurant equipment, computers, servers, all of that stuff that's not nailed down. Under Prop 15, the first $500,000 in fixtures and equipment would be exempt for all businesses. So all businesses are getting a tax break on the first $500,000 in their fixtures and equipment. That reduces the tax obligation by hundreds of millions of dollars and encourages new business investment. Businesses that are included or in, and included and excluded under Prop 15. Um, rents, the opposition really loves to talk about rents. 
and how rents are going to go up because property taxes are going up. Well, rents are actually determined by market supply, not property values. If property taxes determined rents, then we should have some of the lowest rents in the country because we have some of the lowest property taxes in the country. We know that's not true. Supply determines rents, not property taxes. This um, levels the playing field. Small businesses are om almost all now paying more than their fair share. They're, pay they're more commonly in business and commercial spaces that are paying at or near current market property values, taxes. Yet they're competing against companies who actively avoid their reassessment to get um, to be able to keep that extra profit for no reason other than to be than being in one place longer. It's not a level playing field. It's an anti-competitive marketplace. Um, so the consequences of that happens when large commercial properties don't pay their fair share is that there's a reduction in, in property tax revenue that reduces the ability of local governments to provide the services that small businesses need, like fire protection, community college programs, public transportation, health care. Moreover, we are all paying more in the, in, in the form of increased fees and sales taxes and gross receipt taxes and parcel taxes and bond measures and more as a way to fund the kind of infrastructure and education that we in, as communities and businesses need to be able to thrive. Prop 15 gives local control of the reclaimed revenue because we know the issues need to be addressed locally and how urgent they are. Um, communities, that communities need to be able to make plans to address the local needs. They need the stability in their revenue streams. Property taxes are a stable source of revenue. And like the state budget, which swings with the stock market and income tax, priorities vary from community to community. What Alameda community needs may be wildly different than what San Diego County needs. Prop 15 provides stable source of revenue and empowers local community leaders to make decisions on how that money is spent. Um, and without needing Sacramento to tell them what they can spend the money on or what they need to do. There is um, some significant new revenue for some of the rural areas and some of the rural counties. Um, an example there. Um, and then the measure also ensures strict accountability and transparency. And I said I was going to talk about this. There are really strict accountability and transparency requirements to ensure the funds that are designated for education go to classrooms. Local control over the school funding decisions means that local school budgets need to, can identify how the money is spent and so that will be subject to audits. Um, and the education money, I'll say again, goes into a dedicated fund and the legislature cannot touch it. We have a broad coalition. The campaign is really about people. Um, the motives are firmly rooted in fixing a problem that is 40 years in the making. Um, we've done it in a practical manner so that it that doesn't um, see the needs of our economy and morality as mutually exclusive. Our co coalition is comprised of advocates on behalf of seniors, educators, faith and community groups, small business owners, students, janitors, doctors, nurses, and first responders. We have housing advocates, environmentalists, municipal workers, and people of every color and creed. We hope that um, you will all help make this happen in November. Um, and um, Pastor Casey says it for all of us. He's seen what's happened to our particularly communities of color and, and the schools. And he, um, so it's going to leverage our strength and the community groups will be there to make sure that money gets spent appropriately. Um, so I'm ready for questions. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can see th things better. And Anne, you're going to read me some questions? That's correct. Can you hear me OK? Can hear you fine. OK. Question number one. LWVC and Schools and Communities First say that Prop 15 will provide $12 billion annually, but the California Legislative Analyst 
expects only 6 to 11.5 billion annually. So our numbers are based on estimates that were done by um, at USC, the in the USC um, I'm Dornsife School, and I'm not sure, I can't remember the exact group, but there's a group at USC. Um, the LAO is, is somewhat, somewhat more conservative, so if you want to stick to the LAO numbers, um, they also, they, the, LA, the legislative analyst accounted for the ramp up period. We went for, you know, we're at maximum, so. Okay. If you own $3.5 million of rental properties, will these be reassessed every three years if Prop 15 passes? Is it rental, of, if, only if it's rental commercial property? Ah. And it will be, if it's rental um, housing, it will not be reassessed until it's sold. So um, rental property, it, it depends upon whether it's residential or it's um, commercial. And remember that split role. So um, even, even though you own a lot of property and there are big corporations that own a lot of rental units in California that will not be reassessed. So. Okay. How do you suggest we combat the ads that are spreading false information? The best thing that I think we can do is to um, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk and, and talk about the lies and scare tactics that the opposition is using and use your credibility as a trusted messenger to, to, to spread the word on this measure. Um, what I'm doing with my neighbors, I am printing out the schools and communities first, the Prop 15 flyer. I'm adding a personal note and I'm putting it in it in I shouldn't say mailboxes, should I? But I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I am leafleting my neighborhood with that, with a personal note from me, so they know who it's coming from. Okay. Good. If Prop 15 passes, won't that give further impetus to large corporations, i.e. large employers, to leave the state? So we still will have the lowest property tax rates and, and of anything, and these big commercial property owners are not going to leave the state. The shopping centers are not going to leave the state because we're still going to be there to shop, hopefully soon. Um, Chevron is not going to leave California. They can't, they, they've got, I mean, I, I live in the Bay Area and they have a huge refinery here. You know, we still need gas. The, the refinery is not going to leave the state. Disneyland is not going to leave California. Um, so I don't think that that's the case. We always get that threat, but think about the practicality of it that there aren't other places they can go with lower property taxes. And yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Is spending of revenue from Prop 15 dictated to only those items that Helen mentioned, or is it up to the county or individual school boards to use the revenue it receives at their discretion? It is up to each board or, um, uh, each board to, to make that or, or city council or um, board of supervisors, whoever it is to make that make the decisions about how the money gets spent. It's also incumbent upon us as community members to lobby for how we want that money spent. Um, I will tell you that there we had we have people in our coalition, we have groups in our coalition, they're very concerned about some of the counties potentially just wanting to build more jails. Um, and, you know, if it's just up to the Board of Supervisors, that might happen. But if we're there banging on their door and saying, no, we want to make sure that health services get funded, that the Registrar of Voters gets funding, you know, that, that foster youth get better support, whatever it is that counties provide. So it goes into their general fund, which means that the Board of Supervisors will decide or the school board or the city council. And then it's up to us to make sure that they, um, we, we hold their feet to the fire and it gets spent on the services that we think they need to spend it on. Okay, um, the next question is a correction of the legislative analyst estimate of net state and local, we don't need that. I have a question for you, Helen. Sure. Um, what what can we do as local leagues to help with the campaign? You know, we thought about in the board, we've talked about, well, should we buy an ad? And who reads newspapers anymore? You know, what can we do? 
<laughs> so there, there's a bunch of things people can do. And the, the, the easiest is that each of you can talk to your friends and your neighbors and your family and make sure everybody you know in California knows about this ballot measure and, excuse me, why it is important to vote for it. So that's, that's the number one thing. Talk to people. And, you know, um, then if you want to do, go another step, there is phone banking that is going on for this measure, and you can join the phone banking. There's also, I think, I believe there is text banking going on, which means you can, you, you can text people. And those are aimed at some targeted people that we really know that we need to persuade. The thing that, that I've done is I, there's a tool called Outreach Circle. Outreach Circle allowed me to send emails to a, a bunch of people that I wanted to then and get keeps track of the responses um, and tell them why I'm supporting Prop 15, why I'm spending my time working on this and how important it is, I think, for them to work on it, to, to vote for it. When I sent those emails out, I got questions back from several of my friends who said, Oh, you know, tell me about tell me about the accountability measures more. So I, you know, I had an email exchange with them about the accountability measures. Um, somebody else wanted to know more specifics about the money that was going to go into their local school district, and so I looked up some numbers there. Um, you know, and so there's there's a couple different tools, but the best thing you can do is as individuals start talking about this measure, um, and 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 telling people why it's important to you, why it's important to your community. Okay, we have a couple more questions that have come in. Sure. Speaking of Chevron, if they are taxed at a higher rate, can't we expect higher gasoline rates in California, a place that has one of the highest gas rates in the nation? So has Chevron been giving you a Prop 13 discount? I haven't been getting one. They've been pocketing these extra, the extra money, whereas the competitor across the street that is the local independent gas station is paying full property tax values and Chevron is just getting more profit. So I don't think so. I think the prices are set by the market. They're not set by um, the actual cost of the property. That's sometimes used with, um, that prices are going to go up on our retail goods. And I'll tell you that if I go into a Target or a CVS or a Walgreens in downtown San Francisco, I'm going to pay exactly the same prices that I would pay if I went to rural Yolo County. So the prices are set by the market. They are not set by the property taxes. And here's a, you're going to love this one. Where do we sign up for texting or phone banking? I will send that in my email that I send to follow up, but you can, um, I believe you can sign up on the Schools and Communities First, the Yes on Prop 15 website. So I'm writing myself a note so I remember that. Um, uh, I will send that to you, Anne, and, and you can send it on. I will send it to the entire membership. Um, Helen, what, can you talk a little bit about what the endorsement of, of Governor Newsom means to the campaign? So it, it just, it, it is kind of the one more um, good housekeeping seal of approval. Sometimes people talk about the league being that, but, but it just, it says that he recognizes the, that this is a, a reform that has been long coming and that the revenue is, is really needed by um, these local governments that have just been starved for the last 40 years. Yeah, I, when I heard that, I thought it was the coup of the century, truthfully. Yeah. Okay, He's, another question, and this is a complicated one. To okay. make needed income after Prop 13 was passed, a multitude of other taxes and fees went in. We have ridiculously high fees for everything. As a result, California is already an expensive state to live in. None of those fees and taxes will go away. Businesses always pass costs on to their customers. Has anyone made an assessment of how much additional cost California residents will be paying after those big businesses start paying their fair share? Okay, so I'm going to talk first about those fees and the extra taxes and stuff. And, and um, 
I hope that most of those have sunset clauses and we will be able to let them sunset. If they don't, then we may need to talk to our local governments about sunsetting some of those extra, um, the parcel taxes and the, the, those kinds of extra taxes and reducing fees a bit. Okay, so that's number one. And the second one, I'm gonna go back and say, prices are set by the market. They are not set by the property tax costs. So I'll just, I'll reiterate that. Okay, and we have the end of our questions. Does anybody else out there have a question they're dying to ask because now's your opportunity? I have one more question for you then, Helen. What about okay. um, polling? What is it showing um, as this, this, there's a really dreadful hate campaign or not a hate campaign, a disinformation campaign that's going on right now against mm -hmm. Prop 15. Is anybody polling to see if the public is buying that? Um, we did, We yes, the campaign is doing polling and doing focus grouping and a whole variety of things. And we know that the best thing we can do to counter that is to call them out for it. So when you see lies and um, and scare tactics. I mean, that's the other thing. When you talk to your friends and neighbors, say the opposition is so desperate that all they can do is lie and use scare tactics and call them out for it. Um, I'm not saying on social media that you should respond to their lies and scare tactics because that just feeds them. So it's the, the standard there is don't feed the trolls. But when you see something, if you're, if you're doing social media, if you see a post that says that it is lies or disinformation or scare tactic, you can do a separate post that says the opposition is at it again. Those lies and scare tactics are false. And then uh, here's the truth. Um, okay. Um, another question. The yeah. irony of businesses opposing this proposition is that with this recession, their reassessment will be lower than it would have been if this proposition had come in at any other time. It, it, that, that is true. But the other irony is that the, these businesses need, they need the services that this, that this provides, that businesses suffer when we have bad infrastructure, when we have undereducated workforces, when we've got um, communities that just are, are not healthy. Our businesses thrive when we have healthy communities and strong infrastructure and strong communities. Um, you know, the, the smart businesses know that. Um, uh, here's another question or a comment, really. Mm -hmm. Sorry to differ, but an example is Costco. Their gas in Carlsbad is 10 cents more than in Vista and 20 cents more than in Escondido, simply because of property taxes and rent pay. Okay. So Costco, I will agree, is the exception to the rule. Costco is the only place I know that, that sets its, its um, gas prices that way. Um, the, if you go into the stores, the inside prices are going to be exactly the same. Um, so, okay. But Costco is, is an exception to a whole number of rules. <laughs> because they're Costco. God love them. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they, they are the exception to how, you, how to treat employee rules. They're exception to, you know, um, to executive compensation rules, um, how to market things. There's exception, all, the exceptions all over the place. But their prices, the uh, gas prices do vary, but their other prices stay the same. Okay. And, and our web mistress, uh, Suzanne Canero, a co-web mistress, Reminds everybody that um, you need to follow LWVNCSD on Twitter. Follow us, she says. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she does good posts. Yes, she does. She's actually, she's done a great job for us. I, mean, I, I think she's wonderful. Okay. Mary Ellen says, wow, I didn't know that. So I'll start using the Vista one instead of the Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good job, Mary Ellen. She's paying attention. Thanks, yeah. guys, she says. <laughs> okay, and I think maybe another one just came in. Oh, Suzanne says, I'm blushing. No, Suzanne, you've earned it. 
Okay, that seems to be it, Helen. I thank you so much for coming. I think that um, us getting active and, and trying to help promote this is what we need to do now. And we'll let you know how San Diego County does. I, I'm going to look at I'm going to look at those results um, and I'm looking forward to having some kind of a virtual celebration the, that night. With, I, was, I was looking forward to a big party, but I'm not going to <laughs> party. It's not going to happen. We're all going to be in our You're going to be realistic singles. now, right? Okay. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your coming. Oh, uh, this was really my pleasure, and uh, I had I had a good time. So, thank good. you all for listening and for the great questions. And I will, as I said, Anne, I'll send you an email, maybe later today, but probably tomorrow. With it's a okay, bunch of we'll forward it to everybody. Yeah, we Perfect. we give everybody everything in this week. Okay. okay. Thank Thanks. you so much. And, and your kittens are adorable. They did gamble around behind you while you did were they? talking occasionally. <laughs> okay. It was great. <laughs> yeah, they're asleep under my feet right now. So oh, they, they've worn themselves okay. out. Thank you so much. Thanks. And thank you all uh, for coming to our forum tonight, everyone. We appreciate it. This is our official kickoff meeting for the year. Now we're going to get busy. But since most of us are up to our neck in voter service right now anyway, our busyness will not be <laughs> noticeably different from what it is right now, as far as I can tell. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night. Good night. <laughs>